I swore I had this set up perfectly before I came out on stage here. Okay, starting back up. Rachmaninoff, again, also known as number two, exists in two versions. The original, uh, published in 1913, and a revised edition, published in 1931. Rachmaninoff was dissatisfied with the original version's length, density, and technical demands, particularly after sustaining a hand injury. However, some pianists were dissatisfied with Rachmaninoff's revisions. After securing the confidence that the composer supported his endeavor, Vladimir Horowitz produced a performance edition that combined various and alternating passages from the two versions. It was approved by Rachmaninoff himself in 1940. This sequence of events set the stage for generations of future pianists, and before long, three camps of performers became established. Those playing Rachmaninoff's original, those playing the revised version, and those playing the combination of the two. Before I move on from this slide, this is the only picture I could find of Rachmaninoff and Horowitz uh, in, in the same photograph. And who is this in the middle? A young Claudio Arau or George Millet? No, it's actually Walt Disney. <laughs> <laughs> Rachmaninoff's changes can be categorized by which aspect of the sonata a given revision most affects. Comparing the two versions of Rachmaninoff's second sonata, Four primary areas of revision appear to cover nearly every change made by the composer. Throughout this lecture, I will be examining how Rachmaninoff's changes affect the structure, thematic continuity, texture, and technical demands of this sonata by performing similar passages from each version of the sonata. The structural changes are often the most obvious. These affect the form through the removal or replacement of a section. Thematic changes involve one of the work's principal themes, one of which we just heard in the opening passage. Textual changes can be found throughout Rachmaninoff's revision, as well as sometimes subtle changes that affect the technical demands of the sonata. By elaborating on the classification of selected but representative passages, I will demonstrate the differences between versions of Rachmaninoff's second sonata in terms of the structure and texture of the music, as well as its thematic continuity and technical demands. Playing both versions with similar passages will serve to illustrate what executive difficulties pianists can expect to face when creating a musically consistent combined performing edition. Displayed are two peak amplitude waveforms that show the variation in loudness over time of two recordings of Rachmaninoff's second sonata. As you can see, the top recording is the original version performed by Zoltan Kosai. And the bottom version is the uh, revised version performed by Alain Primo. Look at the differences. A natural first observation might be that the top waveform has quite a few more large peaks. For example, this and this and this and this, <laughs> etc. Rachmaninoff's revisions generally streamline the sonata for speed reducing thick textures, skipping or truncating climactic passages and transitions, and outright calling for faster tempi in the latter part of the third movement. As noted before, Rachmaninoff hardly left any measures unchanged. Thanks to the variety with which we are left, incorporating revisions based upon the desired musical goal of the performer allows for a spectrum of interpretations. While examining revisions that impact structural aspects of the work, I'll discuss how these changes might affect the performance of the sonata. In the Sonata Allegro form first movement, Rachmaninoff's original exposition ends with the climactic expansion of the closing material. The revised version completely circumvents this passage, leaving out more than a page's worth of music. This can be seen in the first circle on the top waveform. In order to gain a better understanding of how the first movement might function with either passage, the original or revised, I'll be playing both versions of this section. This original expansive gesture anticipates the grand climax of Rachmaninoff's development by introducing bell motives, which build to a triumphant maelstrom of alternating octaves, as well as a new theme that appears later in both versions. The passage creates a second arch of musical tension in the exposition, Perhaps this is the reason Rachmaninoff cut it in his revised version. I will now play the entire passage Rachmaninoff omitted, which starts.
starts about right here. Oh, right there. In fact, I'll play the measure before it just to give you a little bit of context. statement 
as well as the reference to the first movement material, implies that he didn't want to lose the momentum he had built, and thus that the preceding material must move forward relentlessly. It is folly, however, to assume that Rachmaninoff's discarding of a reference to earlier material represented his editorial attitude towards the restatement of themes in general, as this practice formed an integral part of his additions to the revised version of his Sadat. In both versions, Rachmaninoff capitalizes on the lasting impression previous themes and motives have made. This enhances the emotional impact of the sonata and adds to the composition's robustness. The first movement's opening motive and first theme appear throughout the rest of the sonata in both versions. This theme forms the antecedent to a longer melodic line in the original version of the second movement, while Rachmaninoff's revised version of the sonata's second movement includes thoughts from the first movement in its closing section, including a fleeting but complete statement of the first movement's second theme. These flashbacks enhance the cyclic drama of the music's narrative, therefore their implementation has long been a point of interest. Before we proceed, I will play each one of the first movement's primary themes.
Rachmaninoff transfers the bass line's rhythm to the top voice, adding the descending chromatic line we become familiar with. However, this quotation is easily missed in performance because it is so well integrated into the inner workings of the passage. I will now play Rachmaninoff's revised version of the same passage.
The extent to which Rachmaninoff made textual reductions in the revision of the second sonata implies that this was the area in which he felt the sonata needed the most improvement. In the second, and especially the third movements, I have found that these revisions are most justified when they enhance the affect of a particular passage. For example, while I play the heavier original version of the passage I just demonstrated, in the following passage, which has in Rachmaninoff's revised version the same effect of propelling the music forward by creating a sense of hushed excitement, I play the latter. Considering the value Rachmaninoff deemed from his own first piano concerto by dramatically editing the texture of the piano part, it is not shocking to imagine that he would invest similar effort in the hope of improving the quality of his second sonata. Whether or not the pianist should follow these changes, however, is in their hands. The original version of Rachmaninoff's second sonata presents a host of challenges to the performer, some of which Rachmaninoff himself deemed excessive. Many of the revisions found in Rachmaninoff's second sonata, in Rachmaninoff's second version, aid the pianist technically. While the result of many of Rachmaninoff's simplifications is a thinning of the passage's texture, Rachmaninoff's goal elsewhere is simply to render difficult passages more playable. Take, for example, this bell passage from early in this first movement's exposition. Rachmaninoff sets two sustained chords in the foreground, against which another series of chords was added. In the original version, the second set of chords begins only one sixteenth note after the initial chord, making for a problematic leap that requires the performer to find a potentially unconventional solution. Rachmaninoff moderated this difficulty in his revised version by lengthening the time in between chords, including the initial chord, which now sounds an eighth note after its, uh, before its response. I will now play both of these versions. In fact, I'm going to play them slow down so you can really hear the difference, uh, starting with the original. Regardless of what version or what changes are incorporated into a performance of this work, the flexibility to draw from either edition can provide musical inspiration as well as the tools to convey an emotionally appropriate narrative of Rachmaninoff's second sonata. In notes regarding his own performing edition, Stephen Osborne makes the point 
that Horowitz's realization of this samadhi provokes us to reassess the near deification to which great composers can be subjected, and the suppression of the creative impulse in performers which so easily results. Today's pianists are distantly descended from a line of great embellishers, composer pianists who often improvise on others' music. Creating a performing edition of Rachmaninoff's Second Sonata is one of the few acceptable vestiges of this tradition available to us all. And now, after a brief pause, I will perform my own combined edition of Rachmaninoff's Piano Sonata Number no. 2. Thank you. This is the 